Uh, so today is our last uh, uh, discussion about the material for exam two. I need to finish up vocab. Uh, remember, vocab is going to go, what, 17 through 36 through glyco on this exam. Let me finish those last four slides for you. Then we're going to pick up with histology um, and skin today. And uh, this is also going to include this exam on Thursday. We'll also include the material from uh, transcription, translation, the cell and the organelles and mitosis and the cell cycle that we spent quite a bit of time on. So this exam is chapters three, four, and five. Three was cells and organelles and cell cycle and mitosis and cancer, all of that. And then histology. The good news is you saw most of this that's important for you already in lab. You've already been tested on it. So this is not such a strange leap for you. Uh, the, the last of you are quizzed tonight on histology. So you'll be in good shape for histology. And then um, we'll talk a little bit about skin today. And that'll bring us up right to the end of our time. And uh, that'll be what's on the test for you on Thursday. I did move the mastering quiz. You may have noticed, maybe you didn't notice. I did move it by day. It's not due now until tomorrow night at midnight. So what that does is it gives you, right, tonight, tomorrow, I know it's not much time, but it does give you some time to let this material sink in before you have to turn in that quiz. Um, and make sure you also get your mastering homework done before the exam on Thursday at 4.15. Three, right? Three, four, and five. And there's copies of the homework that are just there for you to do if you would want to do them a second time for review. They're there for you, but you only have to do them once. And uh, the copies are there just for that, just as a second option, an option for you. So vocabulary. Yes, question. How do you have to print the copies? Can I do both of them? And I just work better on... It says copy. Doesn't it say copy of? Next... Yeah. Yeah, I think it says uh, chapter three homework or HW chapter three, and then the one that says copy of or something copy. So it's, it's in the title of the assignment. Um, so look for that. I don't think it shows up on the calendar. I think the calendar, it gets truncated. Can you see it? Yeah, you have to scroll over. Well, you just scroll over it. But when you just look at the calendar, it's not a big enough square to say copy on it. But if you scroll on the title, it'll say regular or copy. Okay. Yeah, so, okay, so let's take a look. In lab, uh, you're going to learn tonight, or have already learned, that a foramen is an opening in the bone. So four is opening. If something has the word form in it, like fusiform or spongiform, there's something in that uh, name that resembles a shape of something. So form is resembling a shape of. Fove, when we get to the bones, we'll talk about the, or the, sorry, when we get to the retina, the eye, we'll talk about the fovea centralis. It's a little pit, a depression, found on the retina in the eye. Gamo, think marriage, uh, monogamy, or um, uh, gamete, the marriage of or the union of the sex cells. Uh, then there's ganglia. This term means nothing to you yet. Uh, but when we get to the nervous system, we'll talk about ganglia. Uh, gastro, stomach. Remember, we had hypogastric and epigastric regions of the abdominal pelvic area. Genesis, or genic, both meaning the production or origin of something. Uh, carcinogenic, something that causes cancer. Uh, gero, old age, geriatrics, study of aging process, or you may have heard a disease called progeria, in which case these kids age very, very early and they die of heart disease by age 12. Uh, gest, to carry or to bear, think gestation, during which time a woman is pregnant, she's carrying the baby. Gingivo, your gums, gingivitis, inflammation of the gums, and glia, glue, and I know I have the examples flipped on those last two. Then finishing up today, glom. Um, when we get to the kidney, we'll see the glomerulus. It's a ball of capillaries within the kidney. That'll make more sense in chapter 22 or so. Glosso, the tongue. If you're told to take your medicine by letting it like go under the tongue or dissolve under the tongue, hypoglossal under the tongue. Gluten, glue. Gluten's what holds our food together, right? Our bread products together. And glyco, sweet or sugary. Glycolysis, lysis, the breakdown of sugar. So that'll get our vocabulary. Most of you did really well on the vocab last time. I suspect the same. This is just 17 through 36. Take those note cards, lay them out on a table, and just imagine how could crazy old me put those words together in a different way. And it'll be just like last time. That portion will be fill in the blank. So that you'll have to know well, know the vocab. The rest of the exam is largely multiple choice or word bank. 
even the PowerPoint, just like uh, I've got you know, a word bank or a series of possibilities for you. So you'll find that it's largely uh, Scantron. You'll need your 884-E form, that big green 8.5 by 11 form that you used last time. And it's all we'll do on Thursday. So after the exam, you are free to skedaddle. You do have the entire time. Don't forget you also have, on that exam, you also have uh, those sentences, those uh, 10 terms to put together into, a, into three sentences. Okay. Any questions or concerns about the content that you can articulate right now? There we go. So I'm just going to fly back to where we are. We talked about the different layers of skin. And we were in the conversation talking about epithelial tissues. And you know that epithelial tissues, we'll start here, epithelial tissues are tightly packed cells, right? They're all touching each other. There's very little space outside of the cells. Well, what's holding those cells together are the intercellular junctions. And I described to you four different ways that the cells are touching and holding on to each other. There are the tight junctions. In this picture, the tight junctions are up toward the top of the cells what we would call up by the apical side, right, the top of the cells. That's a tight junction. And then down deeper, there are adhering junctions. They're a little bit deeper, more toward the basal side of the cells. There are also desmosomes. These are like snap or buttons or rivets, structures that are going to hold cells together, especially where they're under higher stress. And then there are gap junctions, which are really just channels they connect the cells together, but there are like channels that allow molecules to move from one side to the other through, uh, or from one cell to the other. This uh, slide also shows us that the basement membrane is not, it, under, under the microscope, we only see one layer, but in fact, it's two layers, right? And there's a layer made by the epithelial cells. That top layer is called the basal lamina. And the bottom layer, which is made by the connective tissue below, is called the reticular lamina. And then I told you last time, I warned you, that I'd be going through some of this very, very quickly because I know that Mr. Mueller has already gone through histology very, very carefully with you. It's one of his areas of love, and I know he has shared that area of love with you. So we know that epithelia are described in two ways. One by the layers, right? One cell thick. We're going to call that simple, right? Simple epithelia would be found wherever there is not a need for protection. And across a simple epithelium is where there would be some sort of filtration process, absorption process, secretion process. But you're not thinking about protection here, right? Protection is a job done by your stratified epithelia. And then there are the stratified epithelia, which, again, you appreciate are, that's a typo, two or more, not one of more, but two or more layers of epithelia. And the bottom layer is directly attached down to the basement membrane. The other cells, as those layers divide and move, those layers are moving toward this apical side, toward the surface. There are many cells here, so this is more protective. This is what you find in your epidermis, your outer layer of your skin. This is also what you find lining your oral cavity, lining your esophagus, lining the, the anus and the vagina. These are all places with abrasion and extra protection and mechanical stress is, uh, is, uh, is found. You also know there's that weird one called pseudostratified. You've seen it. You know it. You love it. You can identify it. You should be okay with pseudostratified, but I'll show you a picture of it in a moment. In addition, remember that epithelia are described by their shape, right, the cells by their shape. And they come in three basic shapes, squamous, squishy, squashy, flat, uh, cuboidal, and columnar. All right, this is all good review. There's one other shape, though, that you were not introduced to, and that is transitional. It's really not so much a shape as it is a cell that can transition. It can change its appearance. And this is the kind of epithelium found in your bladder lining the bladder. And it makes sense. As the bladder is full, the bladder gets stretched, and that layer of cells would look very, very thin and kind of squamous-like. And then when the bladder voids, 
those, that layer then kind of jumbles up and those cells transition to a thicker looking layer. So we have this transitioning as the bladder fills and empties back and forth, and that has a special name called the transitional epithelium. You don't have to recognize it. Okay, so what, I'm gonna show you some pretty pictures today of some tissues um, and of epithelia, but you only need to know the same six that you did in lab. Right? I'm not gonna ask you to know or recognize other epithelia here today. So you keep it simple, right? The same six you know from lab are the same six you need to know for lecture exam. The same six connective tissues we did in lab are the same six you'll have to do here. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going through these. You've already seen these. Uh, this arrow is pointing at the top to a very thin layer, right? That's a single layer, thin. That's simple squamous. Now, simple squamous is found in a number of places. You know that it's found in the alveoli, right? The layer, the little air sacs in your lung. But we also find simple squamous in your serous membranes, right? When I say visceral and parietal layers of your pericardium, your peritoneum, and your pleura, those serous membranes are made up of simple squamous epithelia. And we also find this simple squamous inside your blood vessels. Now, they have different names in different places. Inside your blood vessels within is called the endothelium. Right, so the endothelium is a special layer. It's really just simple squamous epithelium lining the inside of your blood vessels. And it gets a special name because where it's found on the inside within. Mesothelium, mesothelioma, right? A cancer of typically the pleura of the lung caused by asbestos. We turn on the TV, we hear about it. So mesothelioma is a cancer of the pleura, of that simple squamous epithelium. So that's described as the mesothelium, mesothelium, right? The middle layer around the lungs and around the, the organs. And then there is a simple cuboidal. You've seen it. It's usually in a circular arrangement because it's what we find in the kidney tubules. You've seen that one before. And again, I'm not gonna spend more time on these things that you've already seen. Simple columnar. Where have you seen simple columnar? What was our example for simple columnar in the lab? It was found lining the digestive system, the small intestine. And I'm gonna tell you that in lab, the kind of simple columnar we looked at had microvilli, right? Because it, it was absorbing and increasing the surface area for absorption. However, there is another type of simple columnar that has cilia on it. We didn't see that kind in lab, but I'll show you a picture of it right now, and I think you'll appreciate the difference. In this particular view, this is the lining of your intestines. So we saw something like this in lab, and you know your food would be traveling through uh, this area, and your gut would be lined by this layer of simple uh, columnar tall cells, and then there are also some visitors in here. What are these big white billowing cells? Yeah, those are the goblet cells making mucus, keeping your gut nice and moist. That's simple columnar, and along the edge, you cannot see it, but the edge would have this ruffled edge, and those are the microvilli. You can't see individual microvilli, but I assure you they're there, and they're increasing the surface area of this tissue for more absorption of nutrients. The other type, though, would be found instead in the, for example, in the fallopian tube. So along the fallopian tube, we still have these tall, thin cells. But you can see, if you look carefully at this, at this micrograph, you can appreciate that you can see individual little cilia. Right? There are little cilia there. And if you can see those little individual cilia, you know that those are cilia, right? You can't see microvilli. So I do see little hair-like structures. I still see, though, tall, thin layer of cells. So this is simple columnar with cilia. Now, how about stratified? We know these two as well, right? We've got two flavors, keratinized and non-keratinized. What type is, are you looking at? I know you can read. But this is non-keratinized. And how do you know that this is non-keratinized? What are you looking for? Yeah, I see nuclei at the very top, at the edge of this tissue. And what does that tell me? If those nuclei are there, then this tissue is still alive, right? This is still moist, living tissue. And this is going to be found lining 
your oral cavity. Found lining your esophagus, found lining the vagina and the anus, it's not going to be found on your skin, right? Your skin is dead. Those cells don't have a nucleus at the edge. So that's really what you're looking for here. Now, when you're looking at the skin of, or sorry, the epithelium of your skin, then you have keratinized. And in this particular staining prep, the blue on the very bottom, that blue is the connective tissue. So what is my finger, or what is this red represents what? Basement membrane, right? So that red represents the basement membrane. This blue area down below is the CT, the connective tissue. Now what you're seeing is multiple layers of cells going toward the surface, and at the surface they're very dead looking. There's no nuclei. These are the cells in your vacuum cleaner. All right, this is what's sloughing off into the air that you're breathing in right now from your neighbor's skin. It's a lovely thought, right? But it's the way it is. We're going to be going through the layers of skin today. So you're going to see this again, and we're going to be lay, uh, naming these individual layers. Then uh, we get over to stratified cuboidal. You don't need to know this one, right? Because we didn't do it in lab. But I just want you to know, hey, there are examples of stratified cuboidal. You won't have to recognize them. You don't have to tell me where they are. You want to focus just on the six we already did in lab. And oh, by the way, there's also stratified columnar, in case you were wondering. It does exist. We're not looking at it. I'm not holding you responsible for it. It's just kind of a gee whiz moment. We also crossed those off in our Amerman book, didn't we? So we didn't look at those. Not responsible lecture or lab. Then there is um, pseudostratified. Now we're back to something we need, do need to know. And remember, this is found in your nasal passages, in the trachea, lining your nasal passages, respiratory tract. And again, what do we see associated with these cell, with this tissue? What's at the surface, right? I see individual cilia. I also see a lot of goblet cells making mucus. And right here, there would be your basement membrane. So what's below that basement membrane? Connective tissue, right? Connective tissue down below, epithelia above, a jumbled appearance. That's your pseudostratified. Uh, transitional, again, I, I want you to know about it. I want you to intellectually know that transitional epithelium is found in the bladder. It transitions from empty to full. But I do not need you to be able to recognize this. It's a mess, right? This would be an image of the empty bladder. And all the cells have this jumbled appearance to them. And to be honest, it looks too much like pseudostratified. So I never ask you to know this one, so don't even worry about it, right? But this is transitional epithelium found in the bladder. You also know that epithelial tissues um, is found, you know, covering and coating and lining your body, but also your glands are largely epithelial. So I need to spend a moment talking about glands, and glands come in two basic types, exocrine and endocrine. Now we know about the endocrine system, right? A series of glands that release what? Hormones within the body. So what does endo mean? Within and crin to secrete, right? So to secrete within the body. We know this, right? Into the body. So those are the hormones. Now, exocrine suggests that the secretions are going where? Out, right? Out of the body. So exocrine glands are going to release their products out of the body like sweat, like tears, like saliva. Even your gut enzymes, your gut juices that your stomach and pancreas release are exocrine because those digestive juices leave through the intestine and out with your digestive products. And so they really are exiting, leaving the body. They're not going into the bloodstream. The, the, the thing is, is that exocrine glands, in order for those glands to release their products to the surface of the body, there has to be a duct, a tube that carries it. So endocrine glands are described as being ductless. There is no duct. There is no tube. It's just dumped into the body, into the bloodstream. Whereas exocrine glands are characterized as having a duct, a tube that carries it out of the body. Let me show you a picture of this. So this is an exocrine gland. Now, when I look at this picture, I see, I'm, I imagine I'm flying over some suburb 
I'm leaving an airport and I'm looking down and I'm seeing a road going into a kind of a nice neighborhood and all the streets going off from the neighborhood and at the end, all these little cul-de-sacs, right? Little, little cul-de-sacs neighborhood. It's what it looks like to me. What you've got here though, if you take this little box and blow it up, you're looking at, here's the cul-de-sac. And that cul-de-sac is a group of cells and those cells are secreting something. Right? They are exocytosing, they're releasing their products, and those products are going into a duct, and that duct then is carrying it out of the neighborhood. Right? It's going to go where? To either the out of the body or into the gut. Right? But it's not going into the bloodstream. That would be endocrine. Right? Now, this group of cells that are secreting are called the acinus. Okay? Be careful about that word, right? So the acinus is the group of cells at the cul-de-sac, and you see that they're releasing these little vesicles, and they're releasing their products into the duct. So that's a generic view of an exocrine gland. Now, glands come in a variety of shapes and sizes and are equipped to do things differently. I'm going to briefly tell you about the morphology, that is the shape of glands. What I'm really going to spend more time on, though, is describing the way that glands secrete, and I'm going to use the words merocrine, holocrine, and apocrine. That's going to be the focus here. And then, oh, by the way, glands can have watery. When you see the word serous, think watery secretions. Or glands can have mucus or thick, right, thick secretions. Or they can be kind of in the middle, called mixed. I'm not going to ask you to know these different shapes. Just appreciate that glands can come from the most simple little, you know, one, one little street, if you will, to very complex glands. Don't worry about the names. Just recognize that glands come in many different shapes. What I do want you to look at, though, is how do they release their products. The first is merocrine. Merocrine is a, way, a, a type of secretion, a methodology, a way of doing this. And this is how your tears are produced. This is how your saliva is produced. This is how your gut juices are produced. Again, just like we saw a moment ago, there's that cul-de-sac, that acinus of cells. They're releasing their products into the duct, and it's being carried out. Right, so that's your salivary glands, your tear glands, your gut enzymes for your digestive system. Merocrine. These cells are not being damaged at all. So the cells are <laughs> remaining intact and they are not damaged in any way when they release their products. Now that's an important comparison because another way that glands work is holocrine. Holocrine is where the entire cell dies as it's releasing its products. So here you don't really have exocytosis. Here, there's your acinar cells, and they're actually dividing. And when they divide, they're releasing not only secretions, but the entire cell. These, this is how your, your uh, oily, uh, sebaceous glands of your face work. Is it any wonder why they get clogged up? Right? Because not only are they releasing just a watery kind of secretion, but they're, they're secreting kind of an oily uh, mixture along with dead cell fragments. So they kind of get clogged up sometimes at the surface. Right? So the way I remember this is here, the whole cell is destroyed, holocrine. The whole cell is destroyed in the, in the making of this secretion, whereas, what did I see back here? In merocrine, the cell stays merry. It stays happy. It's alive, right? It does not get damaged. So merocrine, the cell is happy, joyful, alive, right? Whereas in holocrine, the whole cell dies in the process. Lastly, there is one that's kind of in the, in the, in the middle. It's called apocrine. This is how breast milk is released and from the mammary glands. And when the breast milk is released, You've got on here the same old cells. Here's your, here's your acinus, your cells at the end of the cul-de-sac. But what you see is that the cells pinch off part of the cell. Now, that part of the cell would be considered the apical portion, wouldn't it? So the apical portion, the part of the cell that's facing the lumen, is released. And 
that is how milk is, is released. So it's kind of an intermediate, the apical, portion, uh, the apical portion of the cell is released. Half of it sort of gets, quote, decapitated. Right, so you decapitate just the apical portion of the cell, breast milk. And then, so you know there's merocrine, holocrine, and apocrine, and then, oh, by the way, some of your secretions are rather watery, and this would be sweat, uh, this would be milk, tears, digestive juices. They would be considered serous rele release, serous products. Uh, then there are mucousy glands that release very thick mucousy type things. <clears throat> and honestly, your salivary glands are a mixed gland. <clears throat> and you've all experienced this. Uh, your salivary glands, when you're hungry, what do they do? They start making more saliva, right? When you're thinking about food or smelling a nice meal, your saliva starts to increase. Now, that saliva is full of digestive enzymes and is very watery. But... What does it feel like when you wake up in the morning? Kind of thick, right? So your salivary glands can also release some mucousy stuff. If you're about to do a public speaking, right, you get dry mouth and kind of thick secretions. So you know your salivary glands can do both mucousy and serous, so they're considered mixed glands. That's it for epithelial tissues. So we talked about where they are. We talked about different types. We talked about the tissues where they're found. And then we talked about different kinds of glands which are largely epithelial. Is there anything in the epithelial land that I can clarify? OK. Well, let's move over to connective tissues. And again, you've already seen all this. So I'm going to go through this rather quickly. You, you can identify cartilage and bone and fat and <coughs> tendon. You know what this looks like, and blood. So let me just go through this quickly and remind you why is it that this very broad group of tissues belongs to the same family? And you know, right, this is the dermis of your skin. Uh, this is tendons, ligaments, blood, cartilage, fat, bone. All of these are connective tissue. I mentioned at the last lecture that all of your connective tissues are arranged or originate from your mesoderm, right, that middle layer. So in that early embryo, the middle layer, the mesoderm, is the layer from which all of your connective tissues are derived. What else came from the mesoderm, do you remember? Muscle, right? So muscle and connective tissues were both derived from the mesoderm. And the ectoderm, the outer layer, gave rise to what? Epidermis, outer layer of the skin, and your nervous system, right? The brain and spinal cord also came from the outer layer. Remember the endoderm, the inside layer? It went on to become your digestive system and your respiratory system, your inside structures. So why, <clears throat> what, do, what do these connective tissues do? You know this list, right? All sorts of things. The, the connective tissues are a very, very broad group. And you know the list, so you can imagine the primary functions of these tissues. Again, what is it that puts them all together? So we've got this table. And when I look at this table, it tells me that all Connective tissues have a common origin. Now, I know that this thing says mesenchymal, and we haven't used that word, so I don't want you to worry about mesenchymal. Just put in there mesoderm. Right, so all of your connective tissues are going to be derived from the same mesoderm, the same middle layer. And then connective tissues have three broad categories. This isn't difficult. So we've got the first one uh, is going to be fluid. I didn't mean to cross it out. So your fluid connective tissues, well, there's only one, blood, not difficult. And then there are your supporting connective tissues, the harder ones, bone and cartilage. Again, we've seen this. But we've only looked at one kind of bone. We looked at compact bone. Remember the canaliculi, the osteon, the lamella, the lacunae, all of that story, that's what you find in compact bone. There is, however, inside your bones another kind called spongy bone. We haven't looked at it. We're not going to look at it in detail, but know that it's there. There's also cartilage, three types. We only looked at one in lab. We looked at hyaline cartilage, but there's also fibrocartilage and elastic cartilage, and that's more of a semi-solid kind of uh, supporting connective tissue. And then there's this whole group called connective tissue proper. And under that, there's loose and dense. Under loose, 
we did look at two of these. We did look at areolar, and we did look at adipose fat. Under dense, we did look at regular dense connective tissue, right? Dense, regular connective tissue. We did not look at irregular or elastic. So again, I'm only asking you to know the same six connective tissues that we've already focused on in lab. Why are they all sort of part of the same family? We went through this as well. Connective tissues are composed of loosely packed cells. These cells are loosely arranged. And there's all kinds of different cells. Right? You know the cell type in these. You know there's chondrocytes in cartilage, osteocytes in bone. You know that there's fibroblasts in dense regular and red and white blood cells in blood. And then outside of these loosely packed cells, we find the non-living stuff called ground substance. This is the stuff outside of cells. In blood, it's liquid, right? In bone, it's hard. And within that ground substance, you will find some protein fibers. Collagen, giving tremendous strength to the tissue. Elastin fibers, giving flexibility and elasticity. And reticular fibers, basically creating a scaffolding, a networking, a, 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 a woven matrix upon which other things can build. Together, the protein and the ground substance you might see called the extracellular matrix. Everything outside of, extra. Everything outside of the cells, the extracellular matrix, that's your protein fibers, that's the ground substance together. Now, some of these cells, when you think about connective tissues, right, you've got blood and you've got bone and cartilage. Some of these cells are considered resident cells. That means they don't move. Of your tissues, which cells don't move? Right? If you have an osteocyte, where is it? Stuck in the bone. It's not going anywhere. Other tissues like osteo or uh, chondrocytes, they're stuck in the cartilage. They're not going anywhere. But then you've got bone, or sorry, then you've got blood. And in blood, the white cells and the red cells are wandering all over the body, aren't they? I just want you to appreciate this is a really broad group of tissues. And some of these cells are considered resident. That is, they don't move. They're stuck in place. They don't wander around the body. So that would be your fibroblasts in the, in the connective tissue. That would be your adipocytes. And then there are some cells that wander around. Don't make it hard. Uh, these would be your white blood cells, your red blood cells, the cells that make your antibodies. Those are cells that are wandering around. I'm not going to ask you to know what these different cells are, like mast cells and plasma, plasma cells. We haven't discussed that yet. And I do want you to have a really good appreciation of this slide. Remember, there's three kinds of protein fibers in connective tissue, collagen, elastin, and reticular. Again, whenever you hear the word collagen, I want you to think this is giving tremendous strength to the tissue. Your bone has a lot of collagen. Your cartilage has a fair amount of, of, of collagen. So collagen gives bones a lot of strength, whereas elastin gives stretch, and again, reticular fibers create more of a mesh-like building block. So if you hear about a tissue having a lot of collagen, first thing, ding, 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 that tissue has a lot of strength. Let's go through these. So loose connective tissue. Which of these do you need to know? Well, there's only two on here that we've already looked at. Uh, this would be areolar, loose areolar, and adipose. We did not look at reticular. So take a look at this. You've already seen these pictures, or ones like it. So what do you see when you look at this? This is loose or loose areolar connective tissue. Now the story, the little word story that goes along in my head for this is I see confetti. I see confetti, right? I see streamers and ribbon and paper pieces all over the place. And I imagine maybe that this confetti was thrown at a parade in, New, in Las Vegas or in New Orleans or some party. And at that party, there were some loose people. So then I remember it, right? So I see confetti at the party, loose people. I've got a little word story. It goes all together, and I don't, re I don't forget it, OK? You're like, what's he talking about? He's crazy, right? But it works, right? I see loose confetti, loose people, loose connective tissue. It's kind of found everywhere. This is kind of the, the stuff that's everywhere and is a building block for many of your tissues. Now, you've also seen fat. You know what fat looks like those big billowing marshmallow-like things. I think of marshmallows. If I eat too many marshmallows, I will get fat. Again, it helps me remember it. 
right? I see the big white marshmallow structures. You did not look at, nor are you responsible for knowing reticular, but what do you see? Does it look like chicken wire to you, right? Some sort of matrix. And again, when you hear the word reticular, you're thinking some sort of matrix, some sort of building block. Don't worry about it. I'm not going to ask you to know reticular. Then there are the dense connective tissues. Hmm. Which of these do you need to know? Dense regular, right? Dense irregular and elastic, you don't need to know. So what kind is this? It tells us this is dense regular. What are you looking at? What are those wavy lines that you're seeing? The wavy lines are collagen fibers. And those collagen fibers give tremendous strength, don't they? And so this is what tendon or ligament looks like under the microscope. Right? So you're looking at long collagen fibers giving tremendous strength to your tendons and ligaments. What kind of cells are found in this tissue making those collagen fibers? These cells are fibroblasts. Right? So fibroblasts are the cells making the fibers. It makes sense. We know that blast means to germinate or bud. So what's germinating from these cells? Fibers, right? Protein fibers. We're making lots of collagen fibers, lots of elastic fibers. Now, the two you don't need to know are dense irregular. But I, do, I don't need you to recognize it, but I do want you to put in your head that dense irregular connective tissue is found largely in your dermis. This is the picture of your skin. And I just want you to realize that dense irregular is a major portion of your dermis, the lower layer of your skin. You won't have to recognize it, but just know intellectually where you find it. And then lastly, elastic connective tissue. Again, you're not going to have to recognize it, but doesn't that kind of look like a rubber band? You can almost appreciate that it can stretch, right? So I'm not going to have you recognize it, but elastic connective tissue would be found in places where you need a lot of stretch. So it would be found in, for example, arteries that have to stretch, or would be found in your vocal cords, things that need to stretch a lot. Then there are the two supporting connective tissues. We know these two stories, cartilage and bone. You've seen it, you know about them, you know the cells that are there, so I'm not going to spend any time here. Um, you know about cartilage, you know that it's a semi-solid kind of uh, tissue, you know that it's made up of chondrocytes that are hanging out in spaces, um, you know that it's more flexible than bone. We're going to find cartilage at the, uh, the nose, the ear. You're going to find cartilage also at your articulating surfaces where your bones come together. Remember, too, that cartilage is avascular. There's no blood flow through it. So when you look at cartilage, you're going to see something pure white. Right? It's very, very pale. There's no pinkish or redness to it because there's no blood. It's very, very avascular. It's going to have a rounded layer called the perichondrium. Similarly, around bone, you have a layer called the periosteum. Periosteum around bone, perichondrium around the cartilage. And there are three types. Hyaline, the one we looked at in the lab. Hyaline means glassy. So this is a very translucent, very glassy appearance. Your skeleton was first made of hyaline cartilage. And if you've ever seen a fetus in about the third or fourth month in a picture, you can see right through their skeleton because it's very glassy, very translucent. There's also fibrocartilage. This is the kind of cartilage found in your intervertebral discs. It's a very shock-absorbing kind of cartilage found wherever there's a lot of wear and tear on the body. And then there's elastic cartilage, which is making up a big part of your nose and your ear where you have a lot of stretch. So here's a picture of one like you've seen. This is hyaline, right? Hyaline cartilage, glassy. This is the most common. This is what your fetal skeleton was largely made up of before it became bone. This is what you find at your articulating surfaces in the bone where bones come together. Pure white. You see those little chondrocytes. Uh, they're living in lacuna. And uh, you see loosely packed cells. And this is an avascular tissue. You don't need to recognize this one, but, well, let me go back. How did you recognize that this is cartilage? What do you see when you see cartilage? Yeah, when I see cartilage, I see eyeballs. Do you see eyeballs? Right? So I see eyeballs. Here's an eyeball. Here's an eyeball. Right? It looks like little eyeballs looking at me. And I just remember that these are cat eyeballs. Why cat? 
because cat and cartilage are close. So I need, my simple mind needs a connection. So I see little cat eyeballs looking at me. So when I see eyeballs, that's cartilage, chondrocytes living in cartilage. Look over here, this is fibrocartilage. I, mean, I, I still have eyeballs looking at me, don't, me, don't I? So there's my, there's my uh, eyeball looking at me. And here's another eyeball looking at me. And now these wavy things in here are collagen, because this is a tougher kind of cartilage. Right, so this is fibrocartilage. And then there is elastic cartilage. I still have eyeballs, but it almost looks like these eyeballs are connected by kind of elastic rubber bands in here. So this is the more squishy kind of cartilage found in your ear or your nose. Then there's bone, and we know bone, right? This is when we know the best. So you know there are two types of bone. There is compact bone and spongy bone found on the inside. You'll hear more about that tonight if you have lab tonight for the first time on bone. And this is the kind of, uh, when we look at compact bone, this is where you saw the osteons and the central canal, the canaliculi, the lamella, the lacunae. All of that was characterized for you in compact bone. So when you see a picture like this, right, what are we looking at? This entire circular thing is a what? That's the osteon, right? And in the very center of the osteon, what do you have? Central canal with blood vessels and nerves. And when you look at this tissue, you probably note that there are layers, right? So we see layers. And each of those layers is a lamella. Think laminated countertop, a lamella layer. And what is arranged in a circular arrangement are these spaces called lacunae, right? And in those lacunae, there are what kind of cells? What kind of cells make up bone? Osteocytes. Okay. And those osteocytes are cocooned within a hard matrix. They need to communicate one with another. So they communicate through these canaliculi, right? These little cracks that you see between. And that's the way that the tissues are going to have nutrients diffusing throughout the tissue. Now, what I really like about your textbook is that it will show not only a micrograph, but it will show an artist's rendition of that same tissue. And oftentimes, the artists get it better. They, it looks more clear. It, they can show detail in ways that aren't always obvious in the actual micrograph. So here is an artist's rendition of the previous picture. And I think they do a really nice job of showing you the layers, the lamella and the canaliculi, those little canals between the lacunae. Then we have our one and only fluid connected tissue. You know it as blood. You have red cells, white cells, and platelets loosely connected, floating around in this liquid called plasma. And when you look at blood, you just see red cells. The larger, darker staining cells are some of the white blood cells. And we'll deal with naming these uh, and understanding these better more when we get to blood and then even more next semester. So that big cell is a white blood cell. Now, that's it for connective tissues. Again, your focus is on the same six you had to know in lab. This is also a good time, though, since we talked about epithelial and connective tissues, to mention body membranes. When you hear the word membrane in anatomy, it's code for layer, right? A membrane is a layer. And there are four basic types of body membranes. You may have heard of them. The first one's a mucous membrane. It's a, it's, a, it's a layer. It's characterized by having goblet cells that make mucus. And these mucous membranes, the way I think about mucous membranes, any place where I would put Tabasco sauce and it would burn. Right? So mucous membranes are lining and have access to the outside of your body. So if I want to take Tabasco sauce and make it burn, I'm going to put it inside my mouth, right? Down my esophagus. Um, don't try this at home, right? Urethra, vagina, anus. Those are all mucous membranes, but it would burn. Um, there's a visual, okay? But those are, those are mucous membranes versus serous membranes. We talked about these in week one. Serous membranes, the pericardium, the pleura, the peritoneum. These membranes have no way of getting out of the body. There is no way that I can take my finger and touch your pleura touch your peritoneum, or touch your pericardium, right? Those layers are embedded within the body, and they don't have any way of coming out. 
Okay, and you already know those. You already know your, para, your peritoneum and your pleura. Then there is your cutaneous membrane. Well, that's a fancy way of saying your skin. And we're going to be looking at that today. And the fourth membrane in your body is called the synovial membrane. And this is the membrane that goes around your joints. It's fluid-filled and provides a lubrication and a liquid environment in your shoulder, in your knee, and in your, in your other joint spaces. So membrane, just a code word for epithelial layer that has a special function. Now, next week, starting tomorrow, we're going to be in lab five, and that's going to go over muscle tissue. At that time, we will pull out the microscopes, and we will take a look at muscle tissue in more detail. But I do want to at least introduce you to what you're going to see. There are three kinds of muscle, and I'm going to help you come up with a, a word story or a picture story so when you see these again on Thursday, you'll have no trouble recognizing these. Muscle tissue is unique in that it moves, right? That's this whole deal. It's a special kind of tissue that contracts or can move or change shape. And this movement is necessary for our heart to beat, for our skeleton to move, for our digestive products to be pushed. All of those things in our body are dependent upon muscles working properly. So three types of muscle. Number one, skeletal. This is the kind of muscle that moves your skeleton. This is the kind of muscle attached to your bones. And because you have control over that and you can decide to move or not to move, we say that this muscle is voluntary muscle. Then there is cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle is found only in the heart. We don't have any control over it, right? You don't tell your heart to beat, so cardiac muscle is involuntary. The third type of muscle is smooth muscle or visceral muscle. As the name suggests, it's found on your viscera. It's found in your gut, lining your stomach, lining organs and blood vessels. Again, you have no control over those. You don't think about your digestive food moving through, so this is also involuntary. Let's take a quick look, and let me assure you that on Thursday, I'm going to show you these exact same images. So you just need to focus on, when I see this again, what is it? All right, no real detail, just when I see this image again, I know that this is blank. What do you see when you look at this image? This is skeletal muscle. What do you see? Stripes? Striping pattern, right? We see the stripes? Some people tell me they see kind of ugly pink bathroom wallpaper. True. But I see tire tracks. Right? You see tire tracks? Now, just put the story together. In order to have tire tracks, somebody had to have stepped on the gas. And to step on the gas, I had to have used my skeletal muscle. Keep it simple. So when you see tire tracks next time, ah, that's that kind of muscle that my muscles, you know, I had to move my skeleton. This is skeletal muscle. We'll dive in deeper when we get to this later in lecture. But for now, I just want you to have a visual picture of what skeletal muscle will look like under the microscope. Number one. Number two, what do you see here? This is cardiac muscle. Say it again. Yeah. I see bamboo. Do you see bamboo running this way? And I don't know what the right t anatomical term is for the, for the little notches that are in bamboo. But now do you see bamboo? What kind of animals eat bamboo? Pandas. And we love pandas. <laughs> Cardiac. OK? So when you see bamboo, who eats bamboo? Pandas. And we love pandas. And we're thought of the, we think of the heart. So again, use that little silly little thing. If you see bamboo, great. If you don't see bamboo, make up your own story. Right, but I see bamboo, and you'll see that same picture on Thursday. So make sure when you see bamboo that you're thinking cardiac muscle. Fair enough? How do pandas connect to the heart? Because I love pandas, and don't you? You panda hater? <laughs> <laughs> Most of us love pandas. Never a panda. Well, think about it, right? That big teddy bear panda bear that you've always wanted. Okay, now number three. Are you with me now? So smooth muscle. This is smooth muscle. What do you see now? I don't see tire tracks. I don't see bamboo. I don't see cat eyes. I don't see 
tree trunks. I don't see marshmallows, right? I don't see any of the stuff we've seen. This is different. Zigzags. I see worms. Do you see parasitic worms? Little worms. Now, if you had worms, where would they be? In your intestines. Aha. Uh -huh. And guess what? This is the kind of muscle you found around your intestines. This is visceral muscle or smooth muscle. So it's found around your stomach. It's found around your intestines. All right, so when you see little parasitic worms, ah, they're going to be in my gut. I'm not feeling very good today, but that's my smooth muscle. Fair enough? Okay, we'll dive in deeper, more stuff later. Right now, it's just a quick visual. Bamboo heart, parasite smooth, tire tracks, skeletal muscle. The last type of tissue, and you know it, it's nervous tissue. Nervous tissue is special in that it can send electrical signals very, very quickly. We will dive into this in tremendous detail when we get to chapters 11 and 12. But for now, all I want you to know is that when you see this picture next time, this is nervous tissue. The cells in here and all this going on, I'm not going to ask you to know. Just know that this is my picture of the nervous tissue. And the cells here are amazing in how quickly they can send those electrical signals. In fact, these are the longest cells in your body. You have some cells that go all the way from your spinal cord down to your big toe, right? Some cells are three feet long. Is there a sciatic nerve? Well, the cells that make up that nerve, right, are absolutely very, very long. So we'll talk more about that when we get to the nervous system. But for now, when you see this strange-looking configuration, that is nervous tissue. That's it, right? Really, really quick. So how many tissues do you really have to recognize? Six epithelial, six connective, same as lab, plus three muscle and one nervous. All right, the three pictures I just showed you of muscle tissue and the one image of nervous tissue, those are a total now of 16. So you want to have a, a, measure, a, a visual recollection of those 16 different tissues. On Thursday... There will be a fair number of slides on the screen, uh, PowerPoint, and you know you're going to have tissues, and where, are the, where in the body are they found? You're going to have visuals of mitosis, what's going on during the stages of mitosis. You're going to have visuals of a cell and naming the organelles and knowing what the organelles do. And you're going to have visuals of skin, where we're about to go, and what are the layers of skin. So those are the things you can certainly anticipate to expect and love and know well on Thursday. So histology, right? Some of you are digging this stuff, and some of you are struggling with it a little bit more. Again, it takes practice. Uh, you've got your Amerman book. You've got your textbook. You've got online resources. You've got Dr. Google. You really do want to spend time not just staring at one picture. Now, I will tell you, right, the muscle, the nervous tissue, what I'm showing you is all I'm going to ask you to know. But it's really important as you become more... Uh, familiar with histology, that you're looking at different images to figure this out really, really well. The last thing I want to show you are, are some terms related to how tissues can change. Metaplasia. Metaplasia. Uh, this is a changing of tissue, and a good example of metaplasia is what happens in a smoker's epithelium in his or her trachea. Basically, all those particulates, all that smoke, starts to piss off the cells, and they start to change, and they lose their cilia. And now those smoke particles have an easier way of getting down into the deep tissues of the lung, right? So the cilia are gone. You don't have that protection anymore. And 25 years later, we call that cancer, right? So if a person keeps putting those particles into their lungs, then that typically can cause some sort of cancer. Hypertrophy, hyper, greater or more. Trophy means basically size. So hypertrophy is an increase in the size of a cell. So if a cell becomes more plump, that is hypertrophy. Hyperplasia is an increase in the number of cells. Well, if the cells are increasing in number, they must have gone through mitosis. So hyperplasia would require mitosis of cells, division of cells. If you're working out in the gym, your muscles are getting bigger. They're getting bigger for really both these reasons. The cells are increasing in number a little bit, and they're getting bigger. All right, so you have both hyperplasia and hypertrophy going on in your muscles when you work out. Neoplasia, 
new growth. This is typically a tumor. This is not a good news, right? Neoplasia, a new growth. Then there's also atrophy. Now, if you've ever broken a bone and had uh, a cast on for five, six, eight weeks, you know that when that cast comes off, suddenly that whole bone, that whole muscle looks smaller, doesn't it? So this, the muscle has atrophied. That is both a decrease in the number of cells and in the size of the cells. So we have two different terms, hypertrophy and hyperplasia, to uh, talk about increases, but only one term that talks about a decrease, atrophy. Lastly, there's necrosis. Necrosis is tissue damage that is not reversible. This would be a burn. This would be some sort of necrotizing, flesh-eating bacterium, something that destroys the tissues and from which they cannot recover. This would be different from apoptosis. Right? Apoptosis is programmed cell death. It's supposed to happen that way. Necrosis would be some sort of trauma or unexpected tissue damage that is not reversible. So again, think frostbite, think burn, something that damages the tissue. And that does bring us to the end of this chapter. Anything about tissues, any of the images, any of the ideas, do you know how to prepare for and get ready for Thursday? It's very visual, isn't it? Now, a lot of people are excited in lab this week because we're finally getting to the skeletal system, and for the first time, you can touch it. Right? It's hard to touch histology. You can't, you know, it's hard, right? So, but from this point on, we're going to be playing with models. And, and in the lab, you're going to be able to be more, more kinesthetic, more hands-on. So just know that all the hands-on learning is coming. And this test is still a lot of kind of ideas and things that you can't necessarily touch and hold. Anything on cells, transcription, translation, mutations, organelles? Epithelia, connective, tissues, muscle, nervous, glands, anything in there? Okay. Got about a half hour, and we're going to talk about skin. Okay, so moving into skin, uh, the next chapter, and at the end, um, I'll help you make sure that you're ready for this test, but this is the integument, and this is our first system. Yay. Right, it's really our first organ and our first system, the integumentary system. And recall from the first days of class, we know that the integumentary system has a number of functions, and we'll go over those. This is a picture, just a basic idea of a chunk of skin. Some of this we'll dive into later when we get to the nervous system. For now, I want you to recall that the skin is made up of layers. And in your lab, you know that the outer layer was the epidermis, right, number one. And so that's going, to rep that's going to represent all this outer layer. And the epidermis is sitting on the what? That little wavy line represents what? The basement membrane. And below that basement membrane, I have the, the connective tissue. That whole layer down there is called the dermis, right? So the epidermis is made of epithelial tissues, and the dermis is made of connective tissues. And we know that's true, right? Epithelial tissues always sit on top of connective tissues. And down here is where all the business end of the skin is. I mean, the epidermis is largely protective. But down here, we've got nerve endings and hair follicles and sweat glands and muscles and all kinds of cool things that we'll discuss a little bit later. And then underneath all that is the hypodermis, right? Number three, it is not officially part of the skin. The skin sits on top of the hypodermis, or the skin, the cutaneous membrane, sits on top of the subcutaneous layer. Right, so the skin is just two layers, epidermis and dermis, and that sits on the fat layer down below. So the integument and the integumentary system, what is it? Well, the integument is really just a fancy word for that big layer of skin on your body. It is your largest organ as far as body area goes. And it's going to um, include your hair, your nails, sweat glands, as well as sebaceous glands. Now, sweat glands, you can imagine those. Those are uh, going to be kind of watery secretions. So your sweat glands are rather serous, right, to use that word. So your sweat glands are serous, right? They're watery. But your sebaceous glands 
There's a word here that I want you to know, sebum. Sebum is the greasy, oily stuff that your skin secretes. And sebaceous glands are the glands that make this oily secretion. Now, you wouldn't, you don't want your sebaceous glands to go away. They're a pain in the butt, right? Oily secretions on the face and things. But you want your, you want your skin to maintain a certain amount of oil because you want your skin to stay supple and moist. And what happens as we age is that those sebaceous glands get less active and our skin gets drier. And then we're putting on more Vaseline and some sort of oil, some sort of cream on our skin to keep it supple and keep it moist. Um, so we'll talk a, bit more, a little bit more about sebaceous glands. Again, this is your largest organ. Uh, it's about 7 or 8% of your body's overall weight. It can be very thin, only about 1.5 millimeters thick, too much thicker. Think the soles of your feet and the palms of your hand where you've got thicker skin, more protective layers. When you think about the skin, though, this is what I want you to realize. Remember from the very first day we talked about how tissues combine to make organs. And we know well that there are four kinds of tissues. Epithelial, connective, muscle, and nervous. Right? We've just been through that story. Four basic types of tissues. Well, guess what? If I take a chunk of skin, right, if I take a chunk of skin, I am going to have all of those tissues arranged in some way. So within a chunk of skin, I'm going to have epithelial tissues, right? Outer layer. I'm going to have connective tissues. That's the dermis. I'm going to have muscle. We don't think about it, but there's muscle inside your dermis because every time you're scared, those little hairs go up. Well, what pulls all those hairs up are little muscles that are in your dermis. They're smooth muscle. And then there are certainly nerve endings also in your skin. So you've got representatives of each of the four tissue types. If I had a heart in my hand, you'd be able to find in that heart epithelia, muscle, nervous, connective. If I had a brain, right, you'd be able to find those four types of connective tissues arranged in a new and unique way to make that organ. So skin is our first organ, and we see all four types of tissues within it. Now, we've already said that skin is made of two layers. This is not difficult. The outer layer is the stratified squamous keratinized epithelium that we call the epidermis. The deeper layer is the dermis. That is connective tissue. Now, I told you you did not have to recognize this particular kind of connective tissue, but I want you to know about it. I want you to know that the dermis is largely made up of dense, irregular, dense, irregular connective tissue. Not that you have to recognize it, but I need you to know it. Just like you don't need to recognize transitional epithelium, but you need to know that transition is found in the bladder. And you don't need to recognize dense, irregular connective tissue, but you need to know that it's the primary type in the dermis. Now, below all that, right, when we get below the dermis, then you're in the hypodermis, and the hypodermis is largely fat. So down in the, uh, down in the hypodermis, that is low, largely adipose and some of that loose areolar tissue. So when you get down to the hypodermis, that's areolar, loose connective tissue, and adipose. So let's take a look at this image. We'll come back and break this down in greater detail. But what we're looking at here, my pointer is going along the basement membrane. So this wood grain stuff down below, this is connective tissue. I'm seeing multiple layers of the epithelium. So this is definitely stratified squamous. And at the surface, these are dead flaky cells. So this is stratified squamous keratinized. This is what you find all over your body from head to foot. Stratified squamous. And we would call this your epidermis, right? The outer layer of your skin. And we're going to go down and talk about each of these layers, each of these strata. I'll have a slide on each in a moment. I just want to give you that visual as we move into what does this skin do for us? Well, it does protect us, right? We have that stratified squamous that's protecting us uh, from chemicals, from microbes, from temperature extremes. It also keeps water out or water in, however you want to think about it, right? We don't take on too much water when we get in the bathtub and we, we don't lose a lot of water every day. 
It's also largely involved with temperature regulation. When you're really cold, what happens to the color of your skin? It turns paler, right? Why is that? The blood vessels in the dermis did what? They actually close down. They retreat from the surface. And the body is trying to conserve energy. Right? So you become more pale in color in the winter months. In the summer months, when you're hot, when you're exercising, now your skin becomes more red, right? So what's going on? The blood vessels in the dermis open up. They are trying to bring heat to the surface of the body for you to get rid of some body heat. It's like going to the gym and then stepping outside in a cold winter day, right? You're literally, you're, you can see heat coming off your body. Same idea. So there's a lot of temperature regulation going on with the blood vessels in your skin. Don't forget that your skin is the, the beginning of vitamin D synthesis, so UV radiation hits your skin, and in there there's a, a cascade of events that occur to make vitamin D. You have in your skin some immune cells. I'll show those to you in a few minutes. They're called the Langerhans cells. They are little macrophages, little Pac-Man-like cells that are going to eat up any kind of bacteria that try to get into your skin. There's also your nerve endings, your ability to feel hot, cold, pain, vibration, temperature, all of that is located in your skin. And lastly, we sweat, right? So we have sweat glands that are releasing both watery and well as oily secretions. That oily stuff, again, the fatty, greasy stuff is called sebum. There's that word. So sebum, as well as just pure watery kind of secretions with some salt, things that we release as we sweat. So I'm going to go through these five layers. One cell or one slide per layer. And the first one is the deepest layer. We're in the epidermis. Right? This is the epidermis. And the lowest level is called the stratum basale, basement, right? the basement layer, the stratum basale. Now, it turns out there's three different types of cells here found in this layer. So let me, let me point to this layer. It's this, it's this one layer down here. It's this one layer of cells. And this is the layer that's directly touching the basement membrane. In this, though, there are three types. There are keratinocytes. These are the, the most abundant cell type. Remember that eventually, as these cells move to the surface, what are they going to start making? Keratin, right? So they're called keratinocytes. But there's also melanocytes here. Melanocytes are the cells that give your skin pigment. And these are the cells that are making melanin. And depending upon your heritage, you inherited from your parents your skin color, and that pigment is coming from these melanocytes. I'll show those to you in a moment. And then, in fact, in this picture, this cell here and this cell here is a melanocyte. This is too big. And then there are also tactile cells, and this blue guy right here is a tactile cell, and notice it has a yellow tail. It's a nerve, right? It's got a nerve ending to it, so it's part of the nervous system. And that Merkel cell allows you to feel very, very light touch. And also, if you were to you know, have a light burn or get some acid on your fingers, you would know it because those Merkel cells would be activated, and you would feel that tingle or feel that, that, that uh, pressure. Then moving up higher toward the surface is the stratum spinosum. Now, this is this spindly-looking areas. Um, multiple layers of cells. Here, they're all this pinkish layer. So this is the stratum spinosum from here to here. If you look at this picture, you can even see in the very, very small picture, I know it's small, there's actually cells undergoing division. You can see cells undergoing anaphase and mitosis. So these cells are dividing. A lot of cells, they're dividing, they're happy, they're metabolic, they're, they're very active cells. And also within this stratum spinosum layer is where one sees the Langerhans cell. So this yellow dude right there, that represents a Langerhans cell. That's an immune cell. If bacteria were to get through your epidermis and down into the spinosum, that Langerhans cell would act like a Pac-Man, right? And kind of chew up the bacteria. Oh, nice. The next layer, stratum granulosum. If you look, as these cells are moving toward the surface, you will note that there's a dark band in here. So the stratum granulosum is this area right here. The cells start taking on a dark, granular appearance. 
This is where the cells begin to die. So as the cells are moving toward the surface, they begin to undergo apoptosis, programmed cell death. And as they begin to die, their nucleus, their DNA, their ribosomes, their endoplasmic reticulum, all of their organelles are beginning to be broken down, and they have this granular appearance, stratum granulosum. It's a very obvious dark layer. Not very thick, but the cells are becoming flat. They're beginning their dying process. Here, though, is also where the cells have their last opportunity to make keratin. So in this period of time is when the cells are going to begin to fill up with this protein called keratin, that waterproofing protein as they move toward the surface. Then there's the stratum lucidum. Well, lucid means light. So if you hear someone say, you know, they're still with it, their mind is still lucid, what are they saying? That their mind is still bright, right? So you see a, a light layer. It's a light colored layer. It's not very thick. It's called the stratum lucidum. It is only found on thick skin. And I'll describe what that is in a moment. But this is a kind of skin found on your soles and your palms. And I don't know what that means. Soles of heat. That should say soles of feet. Right? The soles of your feet and the palms of your hand. And then at the very top layer, now you're at the stratum corneum. Right? You know a corn is a hardened area of skin. The stratum corneum is all dead, flaky cells. And it can be rather thick or not so thick, but these are all dead cells in the stratum corneum, and they're heading toward your vacuum cleaner. You see no nuclei, right? These are anucleated cells. They're dead and flaky at the surface. It takes about a month for your cells to go from the stratum basale up through all the layers to the vacuum cleaner, right? So about a month for this process. So every month, you've basically regenerated your entire layer of skin. So know your five layers of the epidermis, basale, spinosum, granulosum, lucidum, and Corneum. Should we be able to recognize them too? Or yes, from this kind of picture. So if I were to, perfect example, right? So this picture, they're all the same, right? And there would be a point, name that layer, right? Name that layer. So know your five layers. <coughs> know your five layers. So I mentioned to you thick skin versus thin skin. Thick skin, look at this. You, you don't have anything to compare it with yet. But this is what you're going to find on, again, your palms or your soles. And let me give you help here. That little blue thing that's hanging up, that is connective tissue. In other words, all of this is epidermis. And if you look at this really carefully, what you're going to see is you've got one layer at the bottom. That's your, strat, that's your basale. You've got multiple layers in your spinosum. You've got a little bit of a dark granular layer. Do you see it? That would be your stratum granulosum as the cells are dying as they move upward. Then you'll see a little bit of a light layer, right? See a little light space? That'd be that stratum lucidum. It's only going to be found in your thick skin. And then everything above that, all of these layers are the dead flaky layers, the corneum. Okay. So again, that's only found palms and soles, fingertips, things like that. It's significantly thicker and again has all five layers of the epidermis. Another characteristic though of thick skin, no hair, right? If you have hair on your palms, the Smithsonian wants your body, right? There's no hair on your palms, right? So our palms are different. Our thick skin has no hair and our thick skin tends to sweat differently, doesn't it, than the rest of our body. So we get sweaty palms and sweaty feet in a different way than we have sweat on the rest of our body versus thin skin. So thick on the left, thin skin on the right. Thin skin is what's found all over your body. From top to bottom, everywhere else on your body, except for your palm and your soles, you have thin skin. All of this stuff down here is the connective tissue. Here is your basement membrane. And you see the layers are much thinner, right? There's a much thinner layer of epithelium. And what's missing here is there is no stratum lucidum. So there's no stratum lucidum in thin skin. 
So there it is. And certainly you have hair in your thin skin. You may not think you have hair in some parts of your body, but most of your body has hair on it, even if it's not visible. There are a few places, uh, genitalia, but for the most part, in your lips, thankfully, right, no hair here. But for the most part, we don't have hair, um, or we, sorry, we do have hair on most places of our body. And stratum lucidum, right, no stratum lucidum in the thin skin. We also sweat differently here. Right? We sweat differently from our regular skin than we do from our thick skin. Let's talk about skin color for a moment. So we look at this continuum of, of color. From the bottom, uh, we see a very dark, maybe of African descent, all the way over to a person who, with red hair who looks very pale, maybe of Irish descent or something in Northern European. And we realize that our body, our skin, gets color three different ways. Two of them are, are not as obvious. I'll start with one of the less obvious ones, hemoglobin, right? You've got blood in your, near your skin, and we already said that when you're sweaty or when you're warm, that your skin appears more red. Why? Because you've got hemoglobin. The same thing that makes your blood red is going to make your skin a little bit red when you're exercising or when it's warm. The thing that really creates most of our skin color, though, is melanin. Now, melanin is a pigment. It, is, it comes in a couple different varieties, which give us the colors of the earth, right, of people. And it's made by those melanocytes. Where were those melanocytes? In the stratum basale. So the bottom layer of the epidermis is where these cells are found. These cells are making the melanin. I have just as many melanocytes as anyone in the room. We all have the same number of melanocytes. What's different is what type of melanin, if, in, if any, is being made. So I don't, I don't make melanin, right? I'm the palest thing on the earth. So I don't make any melanin. Other people with darker complexions make different types of or more melanin. What, but that melanin is protective, right? I go out to the sun, and I'm burning in 10 minutes. I literally get burned in 10 minutes, easily. Other people with darker complexions and more melanin are more protected from the UV radiation and have less, less problems with skin cancer. We'll finish this chapter with skin cancer. We won't get to it today, but we'll talk about it a little bit later in the course. And then the third thing that gives us skin color is carotene. This is actually from our diet. This is carrots, vitamin A. If you take a lot of supplements or a lot of uh, carotene supplements, your, your skin will actually kind of take on an orangey hue. Right, if you're really overdoing your supplements. But for the most part, our skin color comes from melanin. So it's not even fair to say that your skin color is only, no, what's the word, phrasing? Color is only skin deep? It's not even skin deep. It's only epidermis deep, right? Because your dermis, we're all the same in the dermis. It's only that little bit on the outside. So if melanin gives us protection from the UV rays, if you think about it, where are people with darker complexions? Where on the earth are they, are they from? Uh, right, the darker folks are from the equator, and as we move toward the poles, people historically are lighter in complexion. Where do you think, then, is the highest rate of skin cancer? Not much sun up there, though. People are paler, right, but there's less sun. But where is everything kind of backwards, and where might the highest rate of skin cancer be? And the answer is Northern Australia. Now why? Northern Australia, Southern Hemisphere, is closer to the equator. And you get a bunch of misplaced Europeans that live there. Right? They don't belong there. Right? They came from Europe. They got white skin, really light skin, and they're living in the tropics. And as a result, right, they're suffering the consequence of having a really high rate of skin cancer because their body's not adapted to living in that environment. You know that epithelial tissues typically don't have any blood in them, but there are a couple of exceptions. And we see the pictures here of exceptions. I'm going to start on the bottom of this slide. And that is hemangiomas. Hemangi, or hemo, means blood. And you know that angi means blood, or sorry, means vessel. So blood and vessels, right, toward the surface of the skin. So in this top picture, this is a strawberry mark. This is the birth mark that typically goes away. These are called um, 
capillary hemangiomas or strawberry birthmarks. And most of my kids, four of my kids, were born with some sort of strawberry mark on their chest or their back or their head, and they tend to go away. By kindergarten, they're gone. You don't even see them. But there are other examples of hemangiomas, cavernous hemangiomas, and that's the port wine stain that this guy's got down here. It's what Gorbachev had on his head. It's what Drew Brees has on his face. It's a, it's a birthmark that doesn't go away, but it's blood vessels very, very close to the surface of the skin, a hemangioma. There are other markings on the skin, freckles. My little boy has lots of freckles in the summertime especially. Basically, that UV radiation from the sun creates a, a higher expression of his melanosomes, right? His, his melanocyte cells are more active. Not that he has more of those cells, but they're more active, so that gives him his little pigmented freckles in the summer, and they go away more in the wintertime. And then we also have nevises or moles, and what moles are really are overactive melanocytes, right? Those melanin-forming cells can become basically like little benign tumors that create moles. Now, those moles can become malignant, can become fully cancerous if they're exposed to more UV radiation. So if you have moles, it's really important that they're being checked by your doctor. And every year, you're looking to see, are those moles changing in color and size, and are they becoming cancerous? Because moles that go cancerous are nasty ones. Right, so you want to make sure you're checking your moles, having them lopped off, check the pathology. Make sure every year your doctor is taking a look at your moles. Uh, on the surface of your skin, we've got fingerprints. We know that. And your fingerprints are a random arrangement of your epidermis sitting on the dermis. Right, it's just an arrangement. It's completely rare or, or, or random. Even identical twins have different friction ridges or different fingerprints. So it's just how the epidermis and the dermis go together. And we've all watched shows. We know that your fingerprints are unique. Don't worry about the different uh, arrangements, but your epidermis and your dermis can create whirls and arches and loops that we can use to catch the bad guy. And that finishes up pretty much the epidermis. Okay, That's the epidermis. I've got just a couple minutes. I know I'm running low, and I'm about where I was this morning. Dermis, we're going down, okay? We're going down in the dermis. This is where all the business end of the skin is. This is down in the deeper layer of the skin. This is where your sweat glands are and your hair follicles and your nerve endings and all of that good stuff in your skin. It turns out that the dermis is made up of two regions or two layers. They're clearly shown here. The dermis is made up of the papillary layer and the papillary layer is just this little tiny bit at the top, just this. And what you see is that the papillary layer is really the, the ridges, the peaks and valleys. It looks like an egg carton or like a mattress pad, right? And that's where the dermis and the epidermis are going to glue together. Papillary means nipple-shaped. So these papillary you know, have these nipple-shaped extensions that are kind of gluing with the epidermis, and that's what's happening to make your fingerprints. Down below that in the dermis is the reticular layer, and that's where all the business end of the skin is, down in the reticular layer. So a slide for each of those. Again, superficial layer is the papillary layer. Deeper to that is the reticular layer. The papillary layer does have some nerve endings in it. If you look up here, you see some little yellow guys. So those little yellow um, structures within the papillary layer here and here are little nerve endings, and that's going to allow you to feel fine touch. So silk versus sandpaper, things that are kind of just discriminating touch, that would be picked up by those nerve endings. Then down in the reticular layer, down here is where you have your sweat glands, your, your hair follicles, and all the other structures of your dermis. I'm going to finish up here just like I did this morning. Stretch marks and wrinkles, lovely thoughts to leave on. So stretch marks, if you've ever had a stretch mark, it's from pregnancy maybe, the skin got stretched, or maybe you gained and lost weight, and you get those lovely little you know, lines, those little stretch marks. What's basically happened is that you have stretched your skin and you have stretched the collagen in your dermis to the point where it broke, right? The dermis is like college, you know, collagen, uh, is like threads that hold things together, and when your skin gets beyond its limit, it kind of breaks. 
and it leaves a stretch mark. And it never really quite goes away. They're difficult to deal with. So that's what stretch marks are. It's when you've actually torn the collagen fibers. The skin has been stretched beyond its natural limits. There's also wrinkles. So with age and with increased UV exposure, the skin be, starts to get rougher, tougher. It doesn't stretch quite the same. And the dermis actually gets thicker. And as the dermis gets thicker, we get these deeper grooves in our skin. Okay, and that's leading to wrinkles. And if you look at people who live in the desert southwest or places where they're out a lot, they do prematurely wrinkle. And that's a good warning to those of you who love tanning booths because there's no such thing as a safe tanning booth when it comes to UV radiation. And you might look good for the next 20 years, but then you're going to look like a sharp head. <laughs> okay? So if you're all about that kind of looking dog, go to the tanning booth, enjoy it. Well, it lasts, but you will prematurely age and wrinkle from that UV exposure. One more slide, guys, and then I got a little announcement for you. The, the collagen fibers in your skin are lined up in predictable ways. These are called your lines of cleavage. Now, this, you don't see these collagen fibers, right? But they're lined up in your body, sort of as this cartoon shows you. If you're having surgery, you would want to have your incision be parallel. You would want to have your incision be parallel to these lines of cleavage. Because if it's parallel, then it's going to heal better. It's not going to pull apart. It's going to have less scarring. But sometimes, either through trauma or you just don't have any choice, the surgeon has to put the incision perpendicular to the lines of cleavage. And that typically, the scar is going to be pulling, the wound's going to pull a little bit more, and you're going to have more of a scar tissue. So a good plastic surgeon is going to make sure that he's drawing those and cutting those lines wherever right, the lines of cleavage are going to show the least scarring and have the least trauma to your skin. Here's what I want you to do. It's exactly where I got this morning. I want you to read through the next few slides. I'm not going to ask any questions about hair or nails. right? I'm not going to ask anything about hair or nails, but just read through it. Um, and then I want you to spend a few minutes looking at burns. Okay? I want you to look at burns. And you get down here. I'm not going to ask any particular questions here. If I do ask any questions, it'll be bonus questions. But what I do want you to see is, here we go, burns. Where'd he go? Oh, come on. There we go, right? And I've got about five slides at the very end. I do want you to focus on that. I'll read about what first, second, and third degree burns are. And as you're reading about different burns, be able to tell me what layers of the skin are affected. So for example, in a first degree burn, just the epidermis is affected. So look at that. Look at the three layers of, uh, three kinds of burns. Know what layers are affected in those burns and know what they look like. And that's all described to you here in these slides. And that will be bonus-y kind of stuff on the exam. Okay, so there will be a case study on the exam You'll read about a little girl who was in an accident, and it will describe to you her burns, and you'll have to tell me, are they first, second, or third degree burns based upon the description? So that's kind of going to be a case study that you'll read about, and by reading through this burn section, you'll be well prepared for that. Not the percentages, I'll tell you that, but I do want you to go on. If you look at the last slide about burns, it does tell you about the risk factors, if that's what you're referring to. And it tells you the chance of surviving or the chance of dying from wounds, from burns of different types. So do look at this slide as well. Okay, there's a bonus question about that as well. So your exam, chapters three, four, and five, mostly transcription, translation, mitosis, cancer, and histology. And then there will be some questions on skin with the burn case study and a few other questions that will be part of a bonus portion on the exam because I didn't have a time to go through it completely with you. Uh, you're going to do great on it, and I will see you all on Thursday for that exam. If you have any questions, email me or come see me now.